As 4th of July weekend rolls around, the Kettleers start their third home and home of the season with the Falmouth Commodores at Lowell Park. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to Kettle Talk, the official pregame show of the Katuit Kettleers. I'm John Perez. When these two teams met on June 23rd, Falmouth brushed aside Katuit 11 2. After the game, the Kettleers manager, Mike Roberts, said that he would reset the team. He put in a new starting rotation and settled in on a lineup. The Kettleers have lost five of seven since that game, but they've played significantly better, including five one run games. They're one in four in that stretch, but a bounce here and a bounce there and they could have had a positive record in those five games. They played another one-run game last night in Wareham, and let's see how they fared. Katuit looking to sweep the home-and-home home with Wareham. Hogan Harris from Louisiana Lafayette gets a start for the Gateman. Colton Hawk from Stanford for the Kettleers. Top two, Jason DeLay socks a 3-2 pitch into the seats in left. His first home run of the year, and the Kettleers lead 1-0. Bottom three with the bases loaded and Colton Shaver at the plate. He hits a grounder to second. Alonzo Jones has trouble fielding it, then rushes the throw over the shortstop Ryan Hagen's head into shallow left field. Two runs would score and the Gateman lead 2-1. to one. Next batter, Gavin Sheets, bloops a single to left. Another run comes in and the Gateman have a 3-1 to one lead. Bottom of the six with Robbie Metz at second. Nico Giratano hits a ball to left. Metz tries to score, and Quinn Brody shows off his gun. He pegs Metz at the plate to keep the game at 3-1. Top of the eighth, the Kettleers would cut into the deficit after a Jack Klein sack bunt. Cal Stevenson came to the plate with runners on second and third. He lofts a fly ball to the left. It's deep enough to score the run. Brody touches up, and the Kettleers are within one at 3-2. The Kettleers would not be able to get a rally going as they went down 1-2-3 in the ninth and snapped their two-game winning streak as they lose to Wareham 3-2. No, I, w I wouldn't. You know, I, I still think we're, we're we're kind of an in-between club. We have decent speed, as you've noticed lately. I mean, we have a lot of left-hand hitters. We've seen a lot of left-handed pitching. And, you know, I think Jerry set that up on purpose today, you know, three lefties, which I don't blame him. And, um, and all three of them were quick to the plate. They slide step and cut down your running game a little bit. So we're kind of an in the, in the middle type club. I mean, all of a sudden we've hit a couple home runs, but do we really think we can sit back and, you know, depend on any of that? No, I don't, I don't think we can. I'm not sure any club can in the Cape. After the game, Robert spoke to reporters about injuries that have befallen his pitchers, including Keith Regala and Jared Padgett. Here's what he had to say. Why was Regala shut down? He's got a little tenderness uh, in his tricep area and a little tenderness in his forearm. And, uh, you know, I try to protect these guys. Um, it's rare because we're a fastball changeup club. Um, now, Hawk throws a few more. He throws a knuckle curve, and it's a little, he doesn't throw a, a slider or a slurve. He throws a knuckle curve, which is a little easier on your arm. He throws a few more breaking balls than normally for us. Um, so it's rare that, that we have to shut a guy down. It does happen, but he feels a little tender. And, and I just said, you know, my obligation is to Creighton and to him to keep him healthy. So we shut him down. And, and uh, he'll be here probably a couple more days. But again, we're, we have no idea where, how we would replace him at this time of the summer. But there's another starter that's, <laughs> that's down, and that, that hurts a little bit. And how about Padgett? I have, days, we're going to look at Padgett tomorrow. and. I really have no idea if, if he's better or not. Um, I'm actually going to play catch with him tomorrow, myself. Okay, I'm going to play catch with him tomorrow, and I'll take a real look, and I'll make a decision after the game tomorrow on Padgett. Uh, well, I think anytime it's in the joint, anytime you, you, you got joint. Now, Regala is, is not necessarily in the joint right now, but it's in two places. And it's been there maybe, I didn't know about it originally. <laughs> I didn't find out about it until a couple of days ago, so it was kind of hidden from me a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I, again, it's you just have to be really careful. And, and we have to, when you, team always comes first until you get to the injury situation, then you got to really take a look at the individual. So the injuries couldn't have happened at a better time for the Kettleers as today is the deadline for all final rosters to be submitted to the league office. They officially released Keith Regala this morning. 
Jason Billis from Coastal Carolina is on the way, as is Rio Gomez. However, Bobby Holmes exceeded his innings limits at Coastal Carolina and will not be joining the team. Clay Fisher was activated yesterday, so that's another spot for the Cataliers. They currently have 29 players under contract. And let's take a look at the transactions that they made this morning. So all of the temporary players have been signed. That means that there are 29 spots occupied. Each team is allotted 30. The only way a player can be released is if they become injured or have to go back to school. Justin Hooper has to attend summer classes at UCLA and will be leaving at the end of the month. August 1st would be the latest. So those are all the details regarding the roster for the Cataliers. Let's take a look at how the rest of the league fared last night and how it translates to the standings. Born over Brewster 2-1, Jake Magnum's RBI single in the top of the seventh gave the Braves the lead for good. Orlean shut out Hyannis. Brian Miller from North Carolina, 2-5, for five, three RBIs. Keegan McGovern had a pinch hit solo home run, his third of the year. YD gets back over 500 with a win in Falmouth. Will Tofi from Vanderbilt, 2-4 for four with an RBI double. Chatham ends their four-game skid with a 4-2 win at home against Harwich. Stuart Fairchild from Wake Forest broke a 2-2 tie in the bottom of the seventh with an RBI single. Patrick Mathis from Texas hit a pinch hit solo home run for insurance. Harwich has lost four of its last five. So here are the standings. Besides Harwich's recent struggles, they're still on top. Orleans within a game, though. YD, Brewster, and Chatham rounded out. In the West, Bourne, Wareham, Falmouth have more wins than losses. Hyannis and Katuit. Earlier today, I caught up with Vanderbilt catcher Jason DeLay, and here it is. I'm joined by Vanderbilt catcher Jason DeLay. Jason, this is his third year on the Cape, last two for Bourne. I was kind of curious how you chose Katuit over going back to Bourne. How did that process work out? Um, yeah, well, after we drafted, I was just kind of sitting at home, you know, waiting to hear from the Giants. Um, and we're just kind of in the process of negotiations and just trying to figure out what I was going to do. And uh, I just kind of figured it would be better to be up here playing rather than sitting at home. So uh, I got actually got the call from Mike Roberts and drove up here two days later, and here I am. I'm not going to ask about dollar figures because that's none of my business or is anyone else's. But you know, you go to the San Francisco Giants as a catcher. You know, got Buster Posey there, and you know, I, I know you're anticipating getting up to the majors ASAP. But does that kind of you know play into a decision to sign with the Giants or play your senior year at Vanderbilt? Um, I don't really think so. I mean, I think any team that I go to, there's going to be competition. So I think it's really just about worrying about myself and just trying to get better every day. In terms of yourself getting better, I know one of the guys that you idolize is Yadier Molina. Do you see yourself as him? And what attributes would you like to take from Molina that you'd like to insert into your game? I don't think Molina is a guy that you can really copy. He just kind of does things his own way. But I definitely have a respect for him and just the I mean, I really like the way he receives. That's something I really take a lot of pride in is receiving and uh, just trying to learn a lot of things from him, just watching him. Coach Roberts has stressed all of his catchers calling their own game, and he tries not to help as much as you know he can. Uh, for you, how has your pitch calling evolved over, let's say, the last couple of years, either from Vanderbilt or even being at Bourne? Yeah, so at Vanderbilt, um, the pitching coach calls the pitches, and my freshman and sophomore year it was more of just you know looking at the card, whatever he called, and putting down a number. But my junior year, as I started to get older and kind of understand pitch calling and pitchers and what they're doing out there, I kind of gained the ability to you know shake off, call something that I thought you know I was seeing, maybe I wasn't seeing. Um, but yeah, so just through that, I feel like I've gained a lot more knowledge about pitch calling and I think it's become an asset of mine. How does your preparation differ being on the Cape as opposed to Vanderbilt because at school you get to play a team in a three game series. Over here it's just once and then you might not see them for another month or you see them back to back, you never know. Um, it's just going out and playing so it's a little different. You don't have the scouting report, you don't have you know, tendencies so it's just, I, I don't know. I, it's just kind of, it's, it's got a different feel to it, and it definitely takes a little bit of adaptation. So. How difficult can that be, though, come second time through the order? Because the first time through the order, you might have hitter A chases a fastball outside, and then, you know, at bat B, maybe you want to go there, but he's expecting it. So how does that change? Right, you just don't know. And another thing is not having caught any pitchers before. You don't know. You know, after a while, you kind of start to figure out what they're doing, but you don't really know certain things, you know, 
what they're doing when they're going good and what they're doing when they're going bad. So it's just, it's tough. It's not certain how long you're going to be here. Um, we've already had Jaron Kendall in Katua. Uh, Kyle Wright was supposed to be here. You actually roomed with him. So for the Kettleweers fans out there that wanted to know Kyle Wright, who is going to Team USA, can you shed some light on maybe your friendship with him or what he's like as a person? Yeah, so I was a uh, roommate with him and road roommate, so I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, he's a great guy, and I mean, he's probably one of the one of the best pitchers I've ever caught, just from a stuff standpoint, as far as like movement. And, I don't know, he's really, really good. <laughs> You're only going to be here for a couple of weeks if it's up to you and you obviously reach an agreement with the Giants, but what are you hoping to improve on and hope that maybe the Giants are here, they see, or anyone else sees that you can add to your game in however how many days you're going to be here? Um, I'd say consistency of hitting. That's definitely something that I want to focus on. I feel like defensively, you know, obviously I can always get better, but defensively I think I have a good, you know, solid base back there but uh, definitely offensive consistency for sure. All right, Jason, thanks for the time. That's Jason DeLay starting lineups coming up right after this.